Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Um, if you're visiting today, I'm Mike Weiglein, uh, the pastor here at ICP, and uh, glad to have you with us. Also, if you're joining online, I would just add my welcome to the ones you've already heard this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 26 this morning, as Katie said. Um, we, uh, we finished our series in 1 John a few weeks ago, and so uh, rather than start another series, we're going to take these few weeks between now and, and the Advent and Christmas season uh, and just look at a few individual scripture passages and what God God might have to say to us through them. So again, this week we're looking at Psalm 26. I would invite you to turn there in your own Bibles, uh, or you can follow along on the uh, slides that will be on the screen. Uh, but let's, uh, let's pray one more time before we go to God's Word together this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the gift of your Word and uh, the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit that has uh, inspired and authored these words. We thank you uh, especially this morning for the gift of the Psalms. And we thank you, Lord, for the ways that, you, that the Psalms teach us how to pray and how they teach us how to pray openly and honestly and faithfully. Uh, Lord, we pray that, uh, that you would um, use these words uh, to teach us how we might approach you in prayer and offer ourselves to you wholly and completely. So we do ask once again that you would speak to us this morning by your Holy Spirit uh, through this passage uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, looking at Psalm 26, starting at verse 1, a psalm of David. Vindicate me, Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord and have not faltered. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind. For I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. I do not sit with the deceitful, nor do I associate with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. Lord, I love the house where you live, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with those who are bloodthirsty, in whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. My feet stand on level ground. In the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Uh, so this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at Psalm 26, but we're going to be looking at it as an example of a particular type of psalm uh, this morning. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit first. Um, I wonder if there's anybody out here who has ever seen uh, either the movie or the show, uh, the, the play, Fiddler on the Roof. Has anybody ever seen that in here before? Okay. Um, so I was introduced to this. You don't have to have seen it. I'll explain it for you if you haven't seen it, what, what you need to know. Um, but I was first introduced to the show when I was at university. I won't tell you how long ago that was. Uh, but I was uh, taking a class on U.S. immigration history. And we were looking at different immigration patterns, different groups of people who had come to the United States over the years, and our uh, professor showed us a clip uh, from the movie Fiddler on the Roof, and it was brief, but the clip taught me something important about prayer that has stuck with me all of these many years. Not everything I heard in university has stuck with me all of these many years, but this one did, and so, uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar, Fiddler on the Roof, it follows the life of a man named Tevye, which comes from the, the Hebrew word tov, and it means goodness. His name means goodness. And he was a Jewish uh, peasant and dairyman who was living in a small village uh, in imperial Russia in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, the play and the show, it's based on a series of stories that were written by a nam man named Sholem Alekim, who lived at that time. And these stories reflected... Uh, uh, what his life was like uh, living in a, in a village like this in Imperial Russia at the time. And the thing that made such an impression on me uh, in college and ever since was seeing that the way that Tevya speaks to God in this uh, clip that they showed, the way that he prays. And if you've ever seen it, then you know that Tevya is very direct with God. He doesn't hold anything back in his prayers. So he says things like this. I picked a, a couple of quotes out for you. He says things like this. 
He says, I know, I know we are your chosen people, but once in a while, can't you choose someone else? That's an honest prayer right there, okay? Or this one, I like this one. Sometimes I think when it gets too quiet up there, you say to yourself, what kind of mischief can I play on my friend Tevya? Okay, so uh, I remember hearing these quotes, these prayers, and thinking, am I allowed to pray this way? Is this, are these words that I can use with God? Uh, up to this point in my life, I think I'd always been sort of taught or formed or at least absorbed this idea that prayers always have to be thanksgiving. They always have to be praise. And, and to approach God this way maybe veers on, on the edge of being irreverent in some way. Are we allowed to speak to God this way? This type of prayer, it's very honest and it's real. And the truth is that it's a type of prayer that we find throughout Scripture. And we find it throughout the Old Testament. We find it with Abraham. We find it with David, especially here in the Psalms. Uh, We find it with Elijah and Jeremiah and Job and especially with Moses. We see that Moses has a very open and honest relationship with God and speaks to God in very open ways like this. And so sometimes I think as Christians that that we look and we see that these kinds of prayers tend to be more common with our Jewish friends. But I think that we as Christians can gain much from learning to pray this way. This is a give and take kind of prayer. This is a kind of prayer where there's expression of real emotions, of questioning, of challenging, of sometimes even accusing God. Now, I'm not suggesting that we drop all reverence in approaching God, but perhaps we may simply start to believe that God actually wants us to be real with him and that he wants to be involved with us in this way. And it's exactly this kind of prayer that the Psalms invite us to be a part of. Now, obviously, the Psalms are filled with prayers of thanksgiving and praise. And and we often uh, will begin our worship services by calling people to, to worship by using one of the Psalms. Psalms that call us to praise and worship God. And these passages, they're they're uplifting and they're inspiring and they often recall God's goodness and his power and his grace. And this is a good thing. We want to have our worship be filled with these kinds of prayers. But the truth is that if you look through the Psalms, that the most common type of prayer that we find in the Psalms are the Psalms of Lament, which is what we're going to be talking about this morning. Depending on who's counting and how you define them, anywhere between one-third and one-half of the Psalms are Psalms of Lament. And again, we find prayers of lament throughout the scriptures. We see them in the books of the prophets. Uh, The whole book of Lamentations uh, is one long lament. They are the Lamentations. Not many of us spend our devotional days reading the book of Lamentations. I know this to be true. But we would learn much from reading that book and and, and inhabiting those prayers ourselves. My point in bringing all of this up is to say that the, the prayers of lament are not the exception in Scripture. They are all throughout it. And so it's part of how we are meant as God's people to learn how to pray to learn how to pray this way. And so that's what we want to talk about this morning. These are prayers which which cry out to God from places of pain and suffering, from places of persecution and of doubt. These are prayers that, that question and challenge God. They ask where God is and why he isn't helping in any particular time. I like the way that the Bible Project uh, defines prayers of lament. They say this, it says, uh, they're poems of lament, they call them poems, but the poems of lament express the poet's pain, confusion, and anger surrounding the horrible things happening around them or to them. They draw attention to what's wrong in the world, and they ask God to do something about it. That is the point of these types of prayers. 
I think as Christians, we're not always sure to do what to do with these psalms. Like I said before, uh, they certainly don't get used in worship services, but so much. Sometimes we'll have a special service that's a, a service of lament, but often we set those aside, not particularly on Sunday mornings. And perhaps we're not sure, again, if we are allowed to pray this way. Aren't we supposed to give thanks no matter what? Aren't we supposed to consider it pure joy when we see have trials of many kinds? And yes, the answer is yes, but we want to hold the Psalms of Lament up with these other passages of Scripture and see how they inform each other. Aren't we supposed to, uh, like I said, consider it pure joy when we face trials of many kinds? And it doesn't always seem very reverent to pray this way. The Psalms of Lament seem to break many of the rules that we have been taught about prayer. But what the Psalms of Lament do, and why it's so important for us to learn to pray them, is that they take seriously the fact that life is complicated, that life is hard, and sometimes we are just plain frustrated or angry with what the things in life that have been given to us. We're not always excited about where our lives are. We don't always feel joyful about what's going on around us. This can be true of either in our personal lives or it can be true in what we see happening in the world around us. It could be because of work or school. It could be because of our family lives, because of our friends, because be because of our health or our money or our time. But whatever it is, the Psalms of Lament give us the words to take our complaints to God honestly. These are the types of prayers that the Israelites were praying when they were in captivity in Egypt, when they were calling out to God to deliver them. Or like in the book of Lamentations, this is the Israelites calling out to God as Jerusalem was being sacked and they were being taken into exile and captivity, calling out for God to help and to rescue them and to deliver them. We might think in the present day that these are prayers that people pray when they're dealing with illnesses, right? Chronic illnesses that they can't seem to be delivered from and maybe never will be. Or people who are growing up in war-torn countries or under oppressive governmental regimes. People who find themselves as refugees and exiles even now. People in prisons calling out to God, how long, O Lord, how long? When will you save us? When will you deliver us? And it's important for people under these circumstances to be able to pray this way, to give voice to their suffering, and to pray in the hope that God will hear and respond to them. Now, it's probably obvious at this point, but our passage today, Psalm 26, is a psalm of lament. Now, it's not the most explicit in its language, and if you read through the psalms, you'll see there are others that are, that are much more even powerful in the way they use them, but it is a lament nonetheless. This is the prayer of someone who has been unjustly accused and who is asking for the Lord to vindicate them, to justify them, Now, we don't know exactly when David wrote this psalm or what was going on in his life at the time, uh, but some scholars presume that it was when he was on the run from Saul early in his life, when he was out in the wilderness trying to escape. And if you all remember the stories of David and Saul from 1 and 2 Samuel, you remember that that David was a young man, that he had been anointed as king by God uh, or by the the prophet Samuel, but on behalf of God, and he was going to be uh, taking Saul's place as king of of Israel. And Saul, in his jealousy, decided that he needed to end David's life, that he was going to pursue him and kill him. And so David got word of this and went out on the run. Even though David had done nothing to deserve this sentence on his life, he was running away and found himself calling out to God in the midst of this. And so when we read the first few verses of this psalm, we see that David is clearly confident in his character, in his innocence. This is what he says. Vindicate me, Lord, for I have led a blameless life. I have trusted in the Lord and not faltered. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and mind, for I have always been mindful of your unfailing love. I have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. David is saying, look, Lord, look at my life. Look at what I have done. And he is emphatic that he does not associate with bad people. He goes on to say this, I do not sit with the deceitful, nor do I associate with hypocrites. 
I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. You can hear David making his case before the Lord in prayer. In effect, saying this, God, the way that I'm being treated here isn't fair and you know it. I'm a good person. I have been faithful to you. I don't hang out with the bad people. I don't associate with evildoers. So what are you going to do about it? Vindicate me, O Lord. David's complaint is, is real, and, and perhaps it's, it's legitimate. And you may have felt similarly to David at some point in your life. God, why is this happening to me? I don't deserve this. David's complaint uh, takes us through most of the psalm, but then when we get to the end, something changes. And we should say this, that David is not necessarily saying that he's perfect by praying this way, but he's trying to be faithful in his life, and he's trying to direct his life towards serving the Lord. And that is the source where he's coming from and saying these things. But when we notice we get to the end, at verse 11, that there is a significant shift that takes place in David's attitude, in his posture toward God, because his demand for vindication becomes a request for redemption and grace. He says this, I lead a blameless life. Deliver me and be merciful to me. My feet stand on level ground, and in the great congregation, I will praise the Lord. David declares that he has come to this steady place and that he wants to continue to bless and praise the Lord. And we see this psalm, which started in complaint, ends in praise. And this movement is typical for the psalms of lament. All but two of them end up in God's praise, even though they start in a place of complaint. And what we see here is that it is by bringing our honest prayers of lament to the Lord that we are often brought to the place of praise. This is where uh, we should be brought to. This is how, at least it should be, the ultimate goal of our prayers of lament, that God would lead us back to a place of praise after we lay out our complaint. My uh, Old Testament professor in a seminary, a woman named Ella Davis, she has a lot of good things to say about the Psalms of Lament, but I liked how she put it this way. She says, when you lament in good faith, uh, this morning, Vale and I, my wife, were having a conversation, how can you lament in good faith, right? Is that even possible? Again, going back to this question of, can we pray this way? Are we allowed to pray this way? But this is what she says, when you lament in good faith, meaning that you are pouring out your complaint before God, as an act of faith, trusting in God, opening yourself to God honestly and fully, no matter what you have to say, then you are beginning to clear the way for praise. You are straining for the time when God will turn your tears into laughter. When you lament, you are asking God to create the conditions in which it will become possible for you to offer praise. Conditions, it turns out, that are mainly within your own heart. This is from a book she wrote called Getting Involved with God, all about uh, the Old Testament and how it speaks to us as Christians. And one of the things I appreciated about uh, the way that Ellen Davis talks about laments is that she distinguishes them from whining or from grumbling, which is another form of prayer that is not offered in good faith, right? I have often whined before God in prayer, and it's not the same as lament, because whining has no purpose to it. It's not directed at any goal or aim. It's not based in God's promises, and there is no sense of hope behind it. Whining just leads often to more whining, whereas lament is meant to lead us to a place of praise before God. The complaints that come through in lament are always with the idea that God can and eventually will do something to set things right, 
even if it's not in our time, even if we don't get to see it ourselves. Again, this is what we see with the Israelites who called out to God from their captivity in Egypt that it was for hundreds of years that they prayed before God answered their prayer by sending Moses. They didn't all get to see the deliverance that God had promised them, but they still called out that trusting that God would one day answer their prayers. While the Psalms uh, invite us to be honest with God about our frustrations and disappointments and angers with him, we are not meant to stay in that place. The prayer of lament is an act of faith in itself in which we, we open ourselves up to God in order to be changed. And changing us is God's business. It's what he wants to do. We notice uh, that there is no difference or no evidence of any difference in David's circumstances by the end of our psalm. He doesn't say, and then God did deliver me or then God did enact vengeance on my enemies. What we see is that by the end of our psalm, David has come to a change of heart. God doesn't always respond to our complaint the way that we want, but he will change us in the ways that we need. And so, brothers and sisters, this morning, I want to encourage you to to adopt these prayers, to adopt these laments into your own lives of prayer. Let them guide and direct you as you pray. And allow God to change you by praying them. And let them eventually lead you into a place of praise of God as well. Praise that is all the more authentic because of where they began. We do well to learn how to pray this way. So that's part one of our sermon, but part two, before we wrap up today, I want us to consider this psalm from another angle or in another light as well. Because one of the things I find so beautiful about God's word is that there are layers of meaning in God's word. And this is good because it means that we can read a prayer of David's from thousands of years ago and believe that it means something for us today. And so on on one level, Psalm 26, it's a prayer of lament by David for being unjustly accused uh, of something, unjustly sentenced for something. But how does this psalm find new meaning if we see it as a prayer that Jesus prayed? How does this psalm find new meaning for us when we see it as a prayer that Jesus himself prayed? Some of you have heard of uh, the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a 20th century uh, German theologian um, just in the time of World War II, uh, ended up being martyred for his stance against the Nazi regime in Germany. Uh, And he wrote a book, The Prayer Book of the Psalms, or excuse me, The Prayer Book of the Bible, all about the Psalms. And he encouraged Christians to pray the Psalms because by doing this, we learn to pray from Jesus himself. This is what Bonhoeffer has to say about it. He says, if we want to pray with assurance and joy, then the word of Holy Scripture must be the firm foundation of our prayer. He says, here we know that Jesus Christ, the word of God, teaches us to pray. The words that come from God will be the steps on which we find our way to God. Now his point in saying this is that as a Jewish person living in the first century, Jesus would have used these psalms. He would have spoken and prayed these very words. When we read the psalms and pray them for ourselves, we know that Jesus also prayed these psalms as his prayers, that he spoke these very words as prayers to his father. And so Bonhoeffer is alluding to this and what he's talking about here, saying that we know that Jesus Christ, the word of God, teaches us to pray through the Psalms. This is what he goes on to say. If we want to read and pray the prayers of the Bible, and especially the Psalms, we must not, therefore, first ask what they have to do with us, but what they have to do with Jesus Christ. We must ask ask how we can understand the Psalms as God's word, and only then can we pray them with Jesus Christ. So in learning to pray from the Psalms, whether they are praises or laments, we are both learning to pray from Jesus, but we also pray with him, which is, I think, a beautiful idea that we get here from Bonhoeffer. It strikes me that when I read Psalm 26, and this is not to take away from what we said earlier, but I cannot pray this prayer honestly on my own even as a lament. 
It's not to say that we can't bring these words before God sometimes and talk about the, the, the ways that we are trying to be faithful and be honest with him about what's going on in our hearts. But the reality is for myself that I have not always trusted in the Lord without wavering. I have sat with men of falsehood and consorted with hypocrites. And if I'm honest, then the truth is that I have been those things myself at times. We know that the same is true of David, despite what he claims here in this psalm. And I don't really want to ask God to try my heart and my mind. It's a risky business to do that. So, when I read this psalm, as much as times I, at times I feel this way and can pray it honestly that this is how I feel or this is coming from my heart, when I read through it, this psalm actually convicts me of my own sin as I read it. But in the mouth of Jesus, these words ring true because Jesus can pray this prayer honestly. Jesus is one who has been unjustly accused. He is the only one who never wavered in his trust of the Lord, his heavenly Father. He's the only one who truly walked in God's faithfulness with the Father's love before his eyes. He's the only one who can truly claim to have washed his hands in innocence. And because of that, he was vindicated by God in the resurrection, just as he asked and it was in his resurrection from the dead that God proved Jesus to be all of these things, to be innocent, to be faithful, to be unjustly accused. And more than that, that he was the Messiah and God's own son. And in this way, Psalm 26 also becomes for us a reminder of the gospel. Jesus lived the perfect life that we are not able to live ourselves and because all of these things are true of him and because God redeemed his life if we are found in him if we put our trust in him then our lives have been redeemed by God as well it's what uh, John Calvin referred to as the wonderful exchange and he describes it this way he says that Jesus becoming a son of man with us has made us sons and daughters of God with him that by his descent to earth, he has prepared an ascent to heaven for us. That by taking our mortality, he has given us immortality. That by accepting our weakness, he has strengthened us by his power. That receiving our poverty unto himself, he has transferred his wealth unto us. And that taking the weight of our iniquity upon himself, he has clothed us with his righteousness. Friends, this is what Jesus Christ has done for us. Through his life, death, and resurrection, we have been made innocent with him. And it is precisely for that reason and that reason alone that our souls are not swept away with sinners and that our feet stand on level ground. So may we respond by blessing the Lord in the midst of the great congregation, just as David wrote. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you alone uh, know our hearts. You alone know what is in them. Lord, you know, alone know how faithful we are or unfaithful we are, how much we desire to follow you and how much we desire to go our own way. So Lord, as we look at this psalm this morning, we, we pray that we could offer up our honest laments to you, that we could look at the injustices of the world around us and the evil in the world around us and to pray like David does and to say, how long, O oh Lord, how long will this go on? How long will you turn your face away from us? But Lord, we pray that we would always offer those prayers in trust, knowing what you have promised, knowing that you have the will and desire to help us and Lord, knowing that you have already given us all we need through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we pray, Lord, that even as we pray, we would always look to his cross and his resurrection, putting our trust there. 
God, we give you thanks and praise this morning for all you have given to us and all you have done for us. And we do look at the world around us and pray, Lord, that you would meet the injustices and evil in this world and that you might even use us as your people to go into those places and to bring your good news and your love. We ask all this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.